Jesus? Are you serving him? Are you telling everyone how much he loves them? Are you remembering how much he loves you? Oh, that's the life that God has brought us into. Peter and I weren't always in that life at all. We were tobacco farmers. We were very much in the world. And God turned everything around for us in 1979. And oh my goodness, what a paradigm shift that was. We had to learn a whole new life in Christ and thank God for that. And we live by grace. We live on the edge. God commissioned us very early on. Within nine months, we were in full-time ministry. We didn't know what we were doing, but God knew. And you know what? He's teaching us every single day and we're doing more and more every single day as we preach the gospel and as we demonstrate the gospel in caring for those in need. It's an honor and a privilege for us to do that. The last couple of days, we've really been able to rest a while. Just three days we've been here, and it's been fabulous. We love your city. We love the place. The sun's not as warm as what we used to, but <laughs> your spring has arrived, I think. <laughs> and one of the privileges we've had is to spend time, quality time, with your leaders. And I hope that you love them like we do. I hope that you honor them and pray for them, and bless them, and support them. You've got amazing leaders here who really love the church, love you with all their hearts, and serve you. So God bless you. Thank you so much for having us with, we, with you. We really do appreciate you. And my dear husband is longing to preach to you. He's got a great word on his heart for you this morning, and I encourage you to open up and receive it. Not just hear it, but receive it. When we receive it, it means we live in it. And I know you will, and it's going to encourage you. God bless. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. For 38 years, this lady has been my partner in everything. And I tell you, we all need that. We need someone who walks through life with us. And she's been the most wonderful wife, but she's been an absolute partner in everything. So... I really love you and appreciate Thank you. My you. privilege. I just was standing down there in the praise and worship and so much enjoying the Word of God and our worship. I mean, it's just so wonderful to be able to sing the truth. And Jesus in Matthew chapter 19 and verse 20, it says that he looked at them and said to them, with men, this is impossible. And you know what? There are some things in our lives which are not possible. It's not possible for the blind to make themselves see. It's not possible for those with an incurable disease to cure themselves. But he goes on. I mean, that's not the end. If that was the end, it would be a problem. He goes on and he says, but with God, all things are possible. Just as we were singing this morning, with God, all things are possible. But then he goes on in Mark chapter 9, verse 23, and he teaches us. It says, Jesus said to him, if you can believe, all things are possible to them that believe. So it takes us a step further. It's not just that all things are possible with God. Somehow we knew that. The big step is all things are possible to them that believe. And you know, as we were worshiping God like that, it really came to my heart, Lord, let us live in the things we sing. Let them not just be songs of worship. Let them be our lives. Let that actually be our daily life that we live in the full understanding that with God all things are possible and all things are possible to them that believe because we'll take our world and our generation. I want to thank you this morning for all of you who have participated in being part of Helping Jam with their feeding programs. I want to show you a little short video on just what it does to a child when you prepare to help them and feed them for a year. Please watch this.
When we met Jacob and his grandmother a year and a half ago, our hearts sank. What his frail body would have to overcome seemed almost insurmountable. His story represented the plight of so many here in Africa, and when we shared it, you responded. We knew your response had saved thousands of lives. But when our team returned to find Jacob, we still couldn't help but fear the worst. We drove anxiously through the village in search of him, and what we found blew us away. Were it not for recognizing his grandmother Marie, we wouldn't have believed it was him, a little boy, running, playing, laughing. Your response had miraculously delivered Jacob this new chance at life. Even Marie had long forgotten how truly close Jacob was to death until we showed her his story. Jacob is the proof that mission feeding truly can take a child who looks like this and turn him into this. Your response was the difference. Now, if Jacob was the only one, we could say our work here is done. But you and I both know it's not. Like Jacob, these children need your help. Let's give these children the same chance at life you gave Jacob. I really believe that it's a miracle that you can change a child's life for $65. You know, sometimes God, through the wisdom he gives us, enables us to do natural miracles. Not that they are supernatural miracles, but with his wisdom, natural miracles. And I believe this is one, that you can change a child's life for just $65 a year. We at the moment are feeding over a million children every day. But do you know that in Africa, we lose more than a million children in a year from malnutrition? More than a million children die every year through malnutrition. And that's improved actually because it used to be 1.7 million. It's come down. I still think it's a total injustice that more than a million kids die every year. And we can change that. We can change that very simply by just saying we can be a part of that. We can make the change. We're on the ground, but what we need is you to be able to say, we'll work with you. We'll partner with you. I want to preach to you this morning from an account in the Old Testament that really totally convinces me that with God, all things are possible. I want you to come with me to 2 Kings chapter 7 and verse 1. And Elisha the prophet says this, Hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, Tomorrow about this time, a seer of fine flour shall be sold for a shekel, and two seers of barley for a shekel, at the gate of Samaria. So an officer whose hand the king leaned on answered the man of God and said, Look, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, could this thing be? And the prophet said, In fact, you shall see it with your own eyes, but you shall not eat of it. To understand the fullness of this prophetic word that Elisha was speaking and to understand the disbelief of this man, you need to understand the background of what was going on here. 
the Syrian army had encamped itself around the city of Samaria and they prevented anything from going into the city and anything coming out of the city. So they were slowly but surely starving the nation of Israel inside the city of Samaria. If you read in the previous chapter, it says that a head of a donkey was selling for 80 pieces of silver and a cup of dove's dung was selling for five pieces of silver. Who would buy a cup of dove's dung? The truth is, there's protein in the dung of doves and these people were trying to survive. They were trying to get through this huge period of challenge and tragedy that had befallen them. So, you know, in 1984, I kind of experienced the same kind of situation in Mozambique. When I went into Mozambique the first time, I was stranded there for 10 days in a village. They were supposed to fetch me the same day. They didn't come back for 10 days. Every day of those 10 days, more than 300 people, uh, more than 30 people starved to death in that village. Many of them were Christians. And in my heart, I was crying out, oh God, how is it that Christians can starve to death? Where are you? Is this your will? And you can imagine that the the nation of God inside this city of Samaria were calling out with the very same thing in their hearts. What has happened to our God? Is this to be our end? What is God doing? We need God's deliverance. You know, many times in our own lives, we have experiences like that. Were we calling out on God? And sometimes it seems that God is not showing up. And that was a situation that was, yeah, in fact, the king doing his rounds, he came across two women who were arguing. And in listening to their argument, these two women had decided that they would boil their children and eat them to survive. And the one had boiled their child and they'd eaten the child. And now it was the chance of the other woman and she had hidden her child. And that's what the argument was about. The king was so distraught that he tore his clothes. That was the kind of situation that these people were in. And right in the middle of this, outside of that city, there were four men that the Bible talks about. They were weak, sick men. They were lepers. That's the reason they were cast out of the city. That's how it worked at that time. If you were a leper, you stayed in the leper's colony. You stayed outside of the city because people were afraid that they would catch the leprosy. And they would come and bring them food out of the goodness of their heart. Well, the city was locked up and these lepers were starving too. And as they sat there, the Bible says, they asked themselves some questions. If you look in verse 3, now there were four leprous men at the entrance of the gate. And they said to one another, why sit we here until we die? If we say we enter the city, the famine is in the city, we shall die there. And if we sit here, we also die. Now therefore, come, let us surrender to the army of the Syrians. And if they keep us alive, we shall live. And if they kill us, we shall only die. And they rose at twilight to go to the camp of the Syrians. And when they come to the outskirts of the camp, to their surprise, no one was there. I mean, this conversation between these four leprous men is not 
exactly a positive confession. It's about dying. If we stay here, we die. If we go in the city, we die. If we remain here, we still die. If we go to the camp of the enemy, if they kill us, we only die. So, I mean, but you know what? They were assessing their situation. And the decision they came to is they were not prepared to sit there until they die. You know what concerns me with the nation of Israel inside the city is they were kind of just sitting there waiting to die. They weren't going out of the city. They had no fight in them. They were making no decisions. They were just in survival mode trying to survive what had come upon them. And yet it was inevitable. But these four men were sick men. I don't know if you've ever seen a leper. I prayed for many, many of them. They are really weak. They are really sick. Many of them have lost their fingers. Many have lost their toes. Some have lost parts of their nose. Leprosy is the most terrible disease. It kind of rots your body while you're still alive. And they're weak. But these four sick, weak men made the decision. We're not going to sit here until we die. Not like the people in the city. They made a move. And they started to walk on the camp of the enemy. And when they got there, to their surprise, there was the noise of a great army. So they said to one another, Look, the king of Israel has hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to attack us. Now therefore they arose and fled into the twilight and left the camp intact, their tents, their horses, their donkeys, and they fled. And who arrived? They fled because they believed the army of the Egyptians, a mighty army, the army of the Hittites, they were coming. They'd been hired. Let's get out of here. And who arrives? Four sick, weak, leprous men. See, when you look at this, you realize something that is so powerful. God had been waiting to deliver the city. God had not forsaken them. God had not forgotten them. God was waiting to deliver the city. But what God needed was for someone to make a move. While they were sitting in the city just waiting to die, while they were sitting in the city just trying to survive, nothing was happening because God needed someone to make a move. And even though these lepers weren't exactly giving a, we'll march on a camp with the enemy, we'll defeat them in the name of Jesus, they were not saying that. They said if they kill us, we will die anyway. But they were prepared to get up and march on the camp with the enemy. And as soon as they made the move, God was able to make the move. And God took the sound of their voices, of their feet, and multiplied it, and multiplied it, until they thought that huge enemies, two of them, were coming. Do you know that when we march on the camp of the enemy, when we march on the devil, what he hears is not one saint coming. He hears the whole army of heaven. Hallelujah. And he's ready to flee, just like the Syrian army was ready to flee. Hallelujah. 
But while we just sit, the devil will play ping pong with us. Amen? We have to rise up. We have to know our authority. We have to know that with God, all things are possible. We have to know that all things are possible to them that believe. And then we can stand up and live the life that God has called us to. And our defeats can become victory. And our problems can turn into provision. But while we just sit, it's difficult for God to be able to move on our behalf. So what happened? When these lepers came into the camp and there was no one there. In verse 8 it says, And these lepers came to the outskirts of the camp. They went into one tent and ate and drank and carried from it silver and gold and clothing and went and hid them. And then they came back and they entered another tent and carried some from there also and went and hid that. You know, this story for me has such a human content. I mean, when you just look at these lepers, first of all, they were extremely hungry. So one can understand that the moment they found the food, they ate it. That you can understand totally. God had provided it for them. But it wasn't just the food. They found gold and silver and clothes. And they took and they went and hid them. And that still wasn't enough. They came back and they found some more and they went and hid there. How often when we have been waiting on the Lord and suddenly God's blessing comes through, we do this. We put some in the bank for a rainy day. We maybe enlarge our house or we buy a new car. And there's nothing wrong with that. But do we also think, I've been blessed. Those people who are still in the city of Samaria, they're dying. But let me look after myself while that's happening. That's such a human inclination, but it's not what God wants. And you see, what I like about these lepers is they were open to conviction and the moving of the Lord in their hearts. I believe that's what it caused them to say, why do we sit here till we die? We'd rather get up and go to the camp of the enemy. But right here, when they were doing this, that same conviction came upon their hearts. And you hear what they said in verse 9. Then they said to one another, we are not doing right. This is the day of good news. And we remain silent. If we wait until morning light, some punishment will come upon us. Now therefore come, let us go and tell the king's household. See, right in the middle of doing what they were doing, suddenly it came to them, we're not doing good. You know, the Lord has been speaking so powerfully into my heart that we're about to enter a whole new phase in the kingdom of God and the power of the kingdom of God. That more people are going to be saved in the next 10 years than what have been saved in the last 50. I really believe this is the time of the church. And, you know, we begin to see that so powerfully already in the southern hemisphere. But it's going to come across the whole earth. But as I read the scripture again, it leapt up in my heart that, you know, it's the church who takes the good news. And it is the day of good news. It's been the day of good news for 2,000 years. Ever since Jesus went to the cross, it's the day of good news. Because it's a day when prostitutes and pimps and drug addicts and drug lords and any and everybody, no matter of color and creed, can come to the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. That's the good news. But it's true what these lepers said. It's not good. 
if we remain silent. And I tell you today, it's not good if we as a church remain silent. This is the day of good news. We ought to be out in our suburbs, in our city, in our world, in our generation, sharing with them. This is the day of good news. If we can't do that, then at least, you know, get hold of a, a cable tie and tie yourself to them and bring them here with you to church. No is not an answer. Get them here. They'll get saved. But we cannot remain silent. This is the day of good news. Next week is Easter. It's an opportunity. Let's take that opportunity. Let's not just fill the church. Let's give the church a problem of where we're going to put all the people and get overflows or whatever because this is the day of good news and we cannot remain silent. Amen. We have to share the blessing of the Lord. So they went back and they told them at the gate. It says in verse 10, they went and called the gatekeepers of the city and told them saying, we went to the Syrian camp, and surprising, no one was there, not a human sound, only horses and donkeys tied and tents intact. And the gatekeeper called out, and they told the king's household. So the king arose in the night and said to his servants, let me tell you what the Syrians have done to us. They know that we are hungry. Therefore, they have gone out of the camp to hide themselves in the field, saying, when they come out of the city, we will catch them alive, and we will get in the city. We don't need leaders like this. When you see the king's response, you realize why they were in the plight that they were. He'd heard the word of the Lord. The prophet had spoken the word of the Lord. Within 24 hours, this tragedy will be over. You'll be able to buy food cheap right here in the gate of Samaria. We, our deliverance will be here. He doesn't believe the word of the Lord. He believes his own common sense. And his own common sense tells him, if we go out of the city, they're hiding. They're just waiting for us. So, who now begins to lead the leader, the servant? I mean, that's not right. It should have been the king who led them into victory. But who leads them into victory? The servant. If you read there in verse 13, and one of the servants answered and said, please let us take several men and five of the remaining horses that are left in the city. And go and have a look. And he eventually agreed. And in verse 14, it says they took two chariots and horses. And the king sent them in the direction of the Syrian army saying, go and see. And they went after them to the Jordan. And indeed, all the road was full of garments and weapons which the Syrians had thrown away in their haste. So the messengers returned and told the king. Then the people went out and plundered the tents of the Syrians. So a seer of fine flour was sold for a shekel and two seers of barley, according to the word of the Lord. We have to, we have to see the power of this, this story, this account. If we're going to see our own lives strengthened, delivered when we need it, healed when we need it, you know it's going to come. It's going to come when we believe the word of the Lord. Not when we believe our own imagination or our own common sense. It's going to come when we believe the word of the Lord. And it could come by prophecy. But it also comes by the promises of the Word of God. Jesus promised us. He said, whatever you ask in my name, I will do that for you so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Is that not enough promise 
for my healing, for my deliverance, for my, my provision, for everything that I need in my life is that promise, that one promise not enough. Whatever you ask in my name, I shall do that for you. Imagine. We really believe that. And we stand up and we begin to ask Jesus knowing Whatever we ask, I'll do it for you. Amen. It's when you grasp and believe in the word of the Lord, that is when God can do miracles on your behalf. That is when you receive by faith. I teach a message in our crusades on how to receive your miracle from God. One of the biggest points in that is faith. Because the Bible says, let this man think, he, let not this man think, he will receive anything from the Lord. And I do a little exercise. I take out a $20 note from my pocket, and I show it to the people, and I say, this is not a promise from God. This is a promise from me. If you'll just come and ask me for this $20 and tell me you need it, I'll give it to you now. You know, amazingly enough, Hardly ever did I get somebody off the front row come forward. It was always someone from further back came running and told me I need the $20, and I gave it to him. And then they were all astounded, and I would ask them, so did you not need $20? Are you so well off that you didn't need to? No, no, we need $20. Can you give us $20? I said, no, it's too late now. You didn't believe in the promise. And you see, I teach them. Faith is simply believing what God has promised. God will also do. It's not complicated. You don't need a mountain of faith. You just need to believe that what God has promised, God will also do. And this word is full of promises. And if we believe he will do those promises, we will receive them. Because God is waiting for us to make a move that we don't just sit there and accept things. In closing today, you know what's the biggest encouragement to me of this account in the Bible? Is that God can use us all. God can use anyone. You don't have to be something special. These lepers were not special. They were not even great men of faith. They were not special. They were sick. They were weak. But God was not weak. And God used them. And you know what it says to me? God can use me. And God can use you. God can use every single one of us. But it does take this. It takes what those lepers decided, and that is to get up and make a move. And if God is going to use you, it will come when you get up and you make a move. When Anne and I got saved, as she said earlier, we were not Near God, we were not even looking for God. My dad got healed through prayer from a double heart attack. We were astounded God could do this for us. The man came to our home who had prayed for my dad, and he shared with us, and we got saved in the house, and our journey began. We were tobacco farmers. I produce enough tobacco, 85,000 kilograms of first-class tobacco, enough to kill the whole of Brampton. I also smoked 70 cigarettes a day. I used to drink more than a half a bottle of whiskey a day. So I wasn't a prime candidate for the ministry. And God called us just months after we got saved. And our only part was, yes, we'll do that. We started a little church on our farm. That was the first thing. We didn't even know how to preach. We went to church, listened to the pastor preach, wrote down everything. We didn't realize that not a gospel message. And I came back and preached exactly the same thing. Within three weeks, 40 people had got saved. You see, our part is to say yes. Our part is to make a move. God's part, he'll do the rest. And with God, Believe me, all things are possible. We are now 30 years into the ministry. 
actually in Jesus alive, it's 31 years with the gospel ministry. We have had the absolute privilege of leading more than 10.6 million people to receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. That, you've got to admit, that's not bad for a tobacco farmer. You see, I struggled to accept our calling. Because even though we were in a small church, when I looked around, there were so many other people who seemed more right to call them. And why was God calling me and telling me these incredible things that even more than 100,000 people would get saved on one day? Do you know that that took 18 years? 18 years after God told me that. We were in Mbujimaya in the Congo. We had 420,000 people in the meeting and 168,000 made a decision to receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And I stood on that platform and wept my eyes out. And the team came and said, what's the matter with you? They thought maybe I was sick or something. I said, you don't understand. God told me nearly 18 years ago that this would happen and tonight it's happened. And you know when he told me, I had never even seen 500 people at a, at, a, at a Christian meeting. So you know, our part is just to say yes. His part is his grace, his empowerment, and he will use you beyond what you have ever dreamed of. Lord, I thank you for your word today. Thank you for this marvelous example, Lord, of these outcasts, these four sick, leprous men that, God, you used so magnificently by your miracle power to deliver the whole nation. What an example to us, Lord. How it encourages us that if you could use them, you can use us. Because, Lord, you're not a respect of person. You look at our hearts, Lord. You look at what your son, Jesus, did for us on the cross. That we became in the righteousness of God by the blood of Jesus Christ. And you look at us as your children, sons and daughters of God. And for each of us, you have a special mission. God, help us to see that and to fulfill that mission. I wonder if there is anyone here today that maybe you are sitting out there and you are thinking, you know, I don't know, but I've never experienced things like this in God. In fact, you might be out there and you really are lonely. Maybe you're still walking in your own guilt. Maybe you haven't understood the love of God yet. Perhaps you're lonely. You need a friend. You know, all of those things, if you will come to Jesus, they'll be solved today. See, maybe you've tried your best. Maybe you've even tried to live your best. But you know, this yearning in your heart's not satisfied. But perhaps you've never actually come to the Lord Jesus Christ and said, Jesus, come into my life. Be my Savior. Save me, Lord. Forgive me. Be my friend. I invite you into my life today. Maybe you've never done that. Now's the opportunity. I would count it such a privilege to be able to pray with you this morning if that's you. And all I ask, if it is you, that you just slip up your hand so I can see you and I can pray with you personally this morning. So if that's you, just slip up your hand for me. I know this is Sunday morning. I know it's a church meeting. I'm not prepared to leave here 
without giving the opportunity for someone who knows in their heart, I need Jesus to respond and come and receive him. So I ask one last time, is there anybody like that here this morning? And just raise your hand for me right now. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. It's wonderful to be in the house of the Lord. Father, I ask you to stretch forth your hand to these people. Bless them. Bless them abundantly. Bless your church, Lord. You promised. You promised Abraham. And we're his seed. Because it says, if you are Christ, you are the seed of Abraham. And heirs to the promise. And you promised him. You said, I will bless you. And you will be a blessing. Bless your church, Lord. Let them be a blessing. In Jesus' name, let your power reside in the church, Lord. So that Ephesians chapter 1, the exceeding greatness of your power to them that believe. According to the working of your mighty power. Let that become a reality to the church, Lord. In miraculous, supernatural ways. In Jesus' name I pray. And I thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. It was my privilege to minister to you. Thank you so much, Pastor Peter. Wasn't that a powerful message? You know, what impressed me so much is, as we've got to know Peter and Anne is to see the humility of heart. Imagine allowing God to use you to reach 10.6 million people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Do you think that makes a difference? Aren't you glad that God keeps records? See, they do it one-on-one -on -one as well as in large settings. The same as you can talk to your friends and your neighbors one-on-one -on -one and bring them out to a larger setting like this. When I was up here with the children, weren't they so beautiful this morning? And you look at them and they're all chubby-cheeked and looking like they're ready to run around already, and some, some are that age. And then I think of the places where you, Peter and Ann, minister. I've had the privilege to travel to more than 50 nations, and when I've been in some of them, and including Africa, the pictures we saw on the screen They're, they're not pictures to me. They, they are real people. And I look across here and I see people from all nations designed by God to worship Him. And when I've been in some of the villages, I was in a village very close to South Sudan in Ethiopia. And we were worshiping God there and I was teaching pastors, but still... There were little children in the same state of malnutrition that we see in pictures. And they were from Christian families, some of them. Were the parents neglecting them? No, they didn't have food to give to them. The children were not guilty of anything. The parents were not guilty of anything other than living in a country that... God had placed them in and being caught in the hunger, the lack in those nations. God has brought us here. We're blessed because of that. Is that right? You know, many of you come from places that have had less than we have here. And you've come for a better life here. But the vast majority of the world doesn't get to do that. They live where they're planted. They live within a small distance of where they were born. And whatever the conditions are, that's what they suffer with. Out of the top ten nations in the world of child mortality, nine are in Africa. And that's where our friends are working. I, I, the numbers involved are baffling to me. 
we met a, a few years back, and at that time they were feeding, I believe it was 430, 450,000 children a day. And as I thought of it, I, I thought this is as many men, women, and children in all of our city. And that's how many need nutrition from someplace else just to survive. Then I heard that they've added the, the education component was added in, and now... Can you imagine more than one million children a day are given food and nutrition and help and education? And then the other arm of the ministry is still reaching out with the gospel and, and seeing literally hundreds of thousands of people come into the kingdom of God and grow to be believers. Did you know Africa as a continent... I believe it has the highest percentage of Christians in all the world. Africa is a continent. And yet there's still so much need there. And so much prosperity here with less than 6% are followers of Jesus. It shouldn't be that way, should it? We need to enter in and help out. The Bible says something very clear in in Matthew chapter 25, Jesus said, I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. And you know the story, if you've read that area. They said, how, how is that possible? When were you hungry? And he said, assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to the least of these, you've done it to me. Friend, how can our hearts... Surrender to God, not be touched by the needs of others. We look at how we can do something here in our city and we're doing things. But these are children, innocent children, that we have the privilege, the honor to be able to rescue. I want to challenge you today. Would you join Jill and me? And invest in some children in Africa so that they can live and they can have some education and they can fulfill the destiny that God planned for them. Well, I pray for them. Very good. Keep praying. I think they were praying in that city in Samaria as well. But it took somebody who was desperate enough that didn't care what anybody else thought to actually do something. I ask you to do something tangibly today with finances. Ushers, could you please pass envelopes out so no one is missed? And I want to challenge you to join Jill and me to give $65 per child. You choose how many you have faith for. We had three lovely children on the platform today. $195 would feed children like that, even a little older, for a whole year. Isn't that so little? But Pastor, I don't have a lot. I understand you don't have a lot. In comparison with the rest of the world, we are wealthy beyond their imagination. So let's do what we can do. If your faith is to reach one child for a year, then do that. If it's to reach ten, then you go ahead and do that. I don't ask you to go beyond what God is touching your heart with. But he, He's touched mine. There may be some that say 65. I can't do that. You know, Sister Ann was telling me of a wonderful little Indian woman who was a retirement age and had so little coming in, but every month gave just a little bit. And how they chose to recognize her and honor her for her consistent caring for others. Caring is important. It's the heart of God. Compassion is the next step to caring. It's where you add your abilities to the heart of God to touch the needs of others.
you're making out a check, make it to BCF. And we'll make sure 100% of it goes to joint aid management. If you've got Facebook, find joint aid management and keep track of them. If you're watching over the internet and want to give, on our website it says donations. Just click on that. You'll see where you can give immediately. And there will be a little field at the bottom as you, as you get to the end of your transaction that, that says put a note in there. Just tell us, Joint Aid Management or JAM, J-A-M. We'll make sure 100% of it goes to this wonderful ministry to touch children in Africa. Many of us won't get there. Jill and I will go. Perhaps we'll take some of you in the future. We're with Steve and Beth Fleming from Koinonia Church this week as well. And you know what they've done? They've had faith to take some of their church members to Africa to renovate some of the feeding centers. How many think it would be good if we could do that in the future? Pray about that. Pray that God would give us the timing to do that. But I believe we want to please God in all that we do. Amen? Lift your offering up, please. Father, we give out of a very tender heart today we sense it's the heart of Jesus Christ for children he said don't send them away bring them close to me father in the nations of the world many of the nations of Africa Jesus is still saying bring the children close to me and I will bless them father father Don't let them be blessed just with kind words, with prayers. But Lord, let them be blessed with the resources to live for Jesus all their days. To make a difference in their nation. To see their destinies fulfilled. To lift up the name of Jesus and not lose their opportunity because of malnutrition. But Lord, help us to do our part so that you can receive all the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Ushers, would you please serve us? Thank you, Jesus. David, thank you. Thank you, Jesus. We actually had four beautiful children coming to be dedicated to the Lord today. And one of the families got caught in traffic and were late. So I I asked Trudy Ann and Ian, could you come please? If you have family and friends, could you come up onto the stage? We want to pray and dedicate your child. Where are you? Are they still here? Please come. Does Jesus love children? Does he love yours? I don't believe he loves yours more than he loves some in Africa. But I believe he loves yours very much. And and we just count it such a privilege that we can dedicate children to the Lord. And God will help us to use our faith together. Friends and family, come up on stage with them, please. Pastor, Sister Reed, come. See, we don't, ded- we don't baptize children. It's not in the Bible. We don't christen children. It's not in the Bible. We do what Jesus' parents did. They presented their child, Jesus, to the Lord. And they did it with faith in their heart that God was going to work in their lives, in his life. Pastor Reed and Sister Lana, could you... Hold that sweet one. So beautiful. So cute. Doesn't she look beautiful? I love children. Mom and Dad, God bless you. Congratulations. Congratulations. This is Trudy Ann and Ian. And let me say it right. Iana Kimora Clement. I got it right. Praise God. 
This is a grandma. She knows how to love babies. It's not about just coming to a church like this. It's about living your life as an example for your dear little one. So I want to ask you, is it your plan? Is it your desire? Are you committed to live for Jesus in your home as a demonstration to children that what it can be like to serve Jesus? She likes me better than you. <laughs> I think so. She's ready, getting ready to smile now. See, the other side, I'll move back away a little bit. <laughs> Stretch your hands out toward them. Will you pray for them if they, if they are, are in need? God can bring, God can bring you guys uh, before people's eyes, you know. So you're going to live strong for Jesus, is that right? Father, I thank you for this dear little one. And we dedicate her to you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We pray, Lord, for you to move powerfully in mom and dad's life. Draw them so close to you, Father, that there is peace and joy from heaven in their home every single day. Lord, let there never be a harsh word, but only soft answers. Reveal your life to them in a fresh new way. Surround them with your people, we ask in Jesus' name. Bless them all. Thank you for them. Amen. See, she loves me after all. God is so good. We have a small gift for you that's so precious. It has a Bible verse on it. We'll keep your little one nice and warm and cozy on the cold nights in Canada. Thank you so much for trusting us. The photographer is here. Praise God. Can I get one too? Okay, good, good. Let, let me, back, but don't fall off the stage. Okay, good. Okay, ready, set. Beautiful. Thank you so much. You got in there too? I saw that. Okay, good. Isn't it great to be part of a family that loves Jesus? It's not about just coming and sitting for a while on a Sunday morning and and wondering, what, you know, what else would you do? Uh, no, it's coming and being part of a family that loves God and loves one another. And so we, we just, uh, we're, we're so happy for that. So if you're here for the first time today, some of you came with friends that were dedicating their child, just come over to our Welcome Center. We have a gift for you before you leave, and some of our leaders want to get together with you, please, and just get to know you. If you wanted to give today into any of the offerings, but especially... For joint aid management, you can go to the kiosk out just outside the door. There's actually two of them there if the line is too long at one. And, and you can use your debit card or credit card there to be able to give. So, so don't let anything stop you from obeying God. And then on your connection card, look at it. Look at the back side. I want you to pass these in as you go out the door today. Commit to memory, Matthew 25, 35. That's, that's that verse that says that you did something to feed somebody and Jesus took it as his own. And then look for opportunities to be generous. Don't be stingy with what God has given you. Be generous. And then pray for joint aid management. And again, I remind you, many of you are on Facebook. Sign in on Facebook. Look them up, joint aid management. You'll come up with a list. You can look at the Canadian one or the international one, whichever one you want to connect with. It's all right. And then on Sunday, on Friday, Friday at 10.30 in the morning, we're going to be here. I hope those watching over the internet can come. And then on, on Easter Sunday, we're going to have this place totally filled because you're going to bring your friends and family. Remember last week, many of you wrote down three names. We've been praying for them through the week, and I know you have as well. We believe they're going to come with you. Come in the same car. Bring them if you can, if they'll fit so that we can have more room in the parking lot. Think strategically. Bring them in. Let's stand together. We love you. We're going to be praying for you all week long. Lift your hands up to heaven, please, one last time. Father, we pray blessing upon your people. We pray for the strength of Jesus Christ to rise up inside. We pray for tender hearts, tender words. Lord, for your life 
and your joy and your peace to be in every household. Lord, help us this week to speak to somebody about you, to share your love with them. We pray for those watching over the internet as well. Bless them this week, we pray in Jesus' name. God bless you. Remember, if you want any more of these wonderful cards, you can pick them up just out in the entranceway as well. God bless you. Serve Jesus all week long.